Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Just like to identify some of the funding agencies uh, that have supported our works over the decades and uh, at the present time. Uh, I am at the University of California, Irvine, but 20 years I was uh, at the University of Arizona in Tucson. In fact, Dara spent a couple of years with us in the early days. Great place, Tucson, Arizona. Uh, nice place to visit and a great university there. Uh, so here we are at the University of California, Irvine. Pretty circular campus, so you never lose your way. Start somewhere and you end up the same place. And uh, the nice thing is about this park at the middle will never be built on. At least they promise, even though we are running out of space, but uh, that's uh, life. And here is a picture of some of the collaborators over the years and the last few rows represent the current students in our center. With that, uh, as a hydrologist or water resources engineer, I, you usually get, uh, probably you do too, how will climate change affect precipitation variability because they know we work in rainfall and rainfall is one of the components of the hydrologic cycle and uh, how would it actually affect water availability. And the next question they usually ask, can you predict the future changes? And uh, uh, not only just changes from an academic point of view, but would be of value to those who have to use the information and make some decisions. So I hope to be able to reflect on some of these things in the next uh, 50 minutes or so. When it comes to global warming, which is always the center of the focus these days, um, and the, its impact on hydrologic cycle, uh, well, obviously, if you look at the physics of it, it's probably straightforward. Uh, you think that with the increase in temperature, you expect to see more evaporation takes place, and three-fourths of the Earth is covered with water, so you expect to see a lot more water evaporate into the atmosphere. Also, with the increase in the temperature, roughly for every 20 degree Fahrenheit, increase in the temperature, the capacity of the atmosphere to store water uh, doubles. Uh, so you can pack in as too much, twice as much of the water particles into a cube of the atmosphere. So what goes up must come down with the residence time of water in the atmosphere of about 10, 11 days. So you expect to see if that's really the case, then you see increasing precipitation with global warming. One of the other factors to keep in mind is that the water vapor itself is a greenhouse gas, sort of, if you wish, and uh, has a greenhouse effect. Uh, but uh, one thing that has been observed through various studies, particularly at the international level through the GVEX programs, uh, which every scientist is part of these uh, World Climate Research Program, that they've seen that the intensification of the hydrologic cycle is something that is detectable in the data. That means we see more frequent uh, flooding and droughts and more severe when they do happen, okay? So with that, the question is then, where are the regions that are impacted and is there any way that we can predict? So what do we have in our arsenal of things to do the forecasting or predictions? Or usually people use these days model projections or they're suggested to use them and models are described here, both physical and statistical models. And then observations are really the cornerstone of what we do. Without observations, uh, it would be very difficult to do anything, both for input to the models as well as uh, for um, validation purposes and uh, many other applications. Uh, there is a whole set of different types of requirements for hydrometeorological predictions. The first group, you could call, call them short-range forecasting, and uh, they're usually in the range of hours to no more than a few days, and they are mostly applicable for weather-related impacts of precipitation, such as floods, flash floods, etc. Then we go into the mid-range forecasting that goes from maybe a couple of weeks to about three months, which we call it to be seasonal forecasts. And those are used for reservoir for operations and many other flood forecast guidance that they provide. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And last but not least, falls into the category of long range forecast that is in the category of what climate 
modeling centers try to provide us with, which is at the decadal to centennial scale. And so this whole range has been experimented and used by our community. And uh, I will not talk about the short range forecasting because I don't have time, even though that's more closer to my own uh, heart because I worked with the weather service for a number of years. And uh, that was the rainfall runoff uh, range. And uh, there have been some developments. Now the big push is towards distributed hydrologic models and their applications. And there is a water center that has been uh, formed in uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And they have focused on trying to develop some of these models. And that would be subject for maybe a future talk by someone from that group. But uh, what do climate models tell us about the future? Because if, in fact, we are to use these kinds of forecasts to answer the question I posed at the beginning, what is the impact of these on water resources? Uh, uh, so there are different ways people try to do it. Uh, the popular thing these days is to take maybe the output of climate models and downscale them to regional scale. And uh, the way that happens is, of course, you generate some future precipitation scenarios. You've heard of the ensemble method. So for that, you take a number of different climate models and have each one of them initialized and generate the same kind of outputs, uh, at least in terms of the concept. But each model is different, and they will generate different types of outputs. And then you combine them together to create an ensemble. And if you're a hydrologist and interested in seeing its impact on your river basin, or the continental scale, or the region of interest, then you take those outputs, uh, the ensemble fashion, and then pass them through a hydrologic model and generate the sequences of runoff for the points of interest in the basin that you're trying to study. And from that, you can do all kinds of scenario analysis and come up with conclusions that you like. And there is no shortage of papers that get published on these particular topics of downscaling, uh, probably I would say, without exaggeration, I don't have any firm statistical information. I would say that about a good 50% of the stuff that gets published these days are results of people doing downscaling and providing the results to the community. And sometimes they do make major statements that sometimes scare people in certain regions. We'll talk about that in a second, too. So let me start with the mid-range forecasting. And uh, you know, not too far from you folks at uh, IRI, International Research Institute at uh, Le Mans, at University of Columbia. They have a series of products. And this particular one is called the IRI Multi-Model Probability Forecast for Precipitation. They use about 20 plus different climate models. And then they do the processing, and every month they come with a prediction at the seasonal scale of three months in advance of the precipitation. So if you look at this one, I downloaded this a few days ago for this talk, February 2018, issued forecast, probabilistic forecast for March, April, May. The warmer colors that you see point towards the probability that most likely precipitation in the next three months will be below the climatological average. And the cooler colors that you see around the world are supposedly increases, or at least expect more than average precipitation, probabilistically speaking. And it gives a scale for that. The white areas are climatology models don't have the skill to tell you anything. And the pinkish areas are those are known as the indicate indicators of dry season, so there is expected no precipitation, no forecast. So the question is how good it is. You can go there and judge it for yourself, keep track of it for your region, and see if, in fact, the model did OK or not. Um, but Leavesy and Timo Fawoya, he used to run the forecast NSEP part at National Weather Service. And when he was working there, he's retired now. But just prior to that, with his wife, they wrote a paper that appeared in BAMS in June of 2008. And the Science Magazine actually picked up some quotes from them saying that 
In fact, most of the skills in these forecast models was nowhere to satisfy the needs, okay? I said useless, essentially. I'm just being polite. But if you go to the paper in science, you'll see that's what it was said. And the only time they said these forecasts had any value was when we had success prediction pressure was winter with an El Nino or La Nino, okay? So that's at, at least on the applications on the U.S. side. So for the El Nino, just a case in point. Uh, if you look at California here, for instance, if we have an El Nino, the December through February, which is the winter time, the likelihood of getting more precipitation with an El Nino year is higher, okay? So remember a couple of years ago, we had the big El Nino that came, and there was a lot of publicity given that Armageddon will happen in California and floods all over the place. The only people who really made some economic benefit were roofers because everybody tried to fix their roofs to make sure that nothing happens. In fact, that particular year, we did not get much rain at all, and that was one of the strongest El Ninos on record that happened. Uh, so that was a little bit of a disappointment. The following year, which was not an El Nino, leaning towards more of a La Nino, which should be probabilistically co correlated with uh, drier for Southern California, is when we had probably one of the most rainy seasons in the history of our state, particularly in Southern California. And as you see, the IRI forecast issued in uh, December of 2016 for January, February, March showed in fact that the likelihood of having less than average precipitation was high. But in reality, if you look at the data, it was just the opposite. So all I'm trying to say is that one has to understand probabilistic estimates do not necessarily guarantee that it is likely to happen uh, what it says, and you have to take it the grain of salt and understand what that probabilistic estimation means. So when we talk about uncertainties, these are parts of it. And uh, when you're trying to explain that to decision makers and others, sometimes you'll find yourself challenged because they think then you guys don't know what you're talking about. So you try to explain it, and it's always a... Uh, a fun process, okay? Longer range forecasts, okay? There's a lot of fascinating papers happening these days uh, that uh, talk about the, the future, and much of it comes from the IPCC process, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and they have these various five-year reports that come out, and now they're at the middle of the uh, IPCC, I guess, is that six now? CMIP 5 happened uh, four years ago. So I'll show you some examples of the CMIP 5 models. And all that data is available on the, on the, uh, the National Laboratory, uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab. You can go and download the data. And that represents all the 20 plus global climate models run by many countries, and they they have certain standards to apply, get the results, projections into the future. And I had a colleague from Beijing Normal University, Dr. Miao, who spent a little time with us, very efficient, effective colleague. And he tried to look at some of those with respect to precipitation and how well these models do for precipitation. And I'm only showing the results for the two of the three scenarios that are used in the IPCC process, essentially. Uh, well, let me go here. The 421 parts per million is that if we really, as humanity dictates, we behave and we control all the emissions. And then the last one, the 936 parts per million by the 2100, is when we don't really care and say, what the heck, you know, let's just emit and produce whatever we want, and then we go from there. So if I look at the scenarios that these models are run, uh, so just comparing just four of the models, and one of them is the French model, the Australian model, the US, UK. You can take any of them, and uh, you will probably see the same thing. So I focus on the Western United States. In terms of their projections, 
of precipitation patterns from 2006 to 2099, so for the next century, essentially. And if you look at it, the warmer colors represent trends downward in precipitation, and the cooler colors show trends upward in precipitation. So if you are an optimist, then you like the Australian model for California, because that shows we're going to likely to see increase in precipitation. If you're a pessimist, you take the French model, because it's not really too much in favor of California seeing much precipitation. So it's a downward trend. And uh, the British is kind of mixed, and then the US model here shows also a positive trend. So I'm, all I'm trying to show here is that the models still have quite a bit of disagreement. While they agree in temperature, and when it comes to precipitation, there are some issues that they cannot necessarily agree on. And if I go to the worst case scenario, which is the RCP 8.5, which is almost 1,000 parts per million by the end of the century in terms of CO2 emissions, and they, they initialize these models and run them. So if you look at there, in fact, you will see, again, different patterns. Now, the US model seems not to be favorable towards Western United States, shows that we're getting drier. And uh, the French model doesn't like Southern California, but prefers the northern part in terms of getting wetter, uh, which we don't mind because most of our reservoirs for southern part are in the northern part of the state. My point is that even you go from one scenario to the next, models actually switch in terms of their projections. So people create these ensembles and then use them for downscaling. Uh, my point is that with those uncertainties, the question is what really you could make sense of. And Science Magazine back in 2007 had an article uh, published which really made a big impact in the Western United States. A lot of people really reacted to it. it the title says, Model Projection of an Imminent Transition to a More Arid Climate in Southwestern North America. And I got a call from some people in the press. Well, you know, I didn't even know the article. I said, let me read it. Well, it didn't really require too much reading to be able to answer the reporter's questions, because as you get into the abstract of it, right there it says, if these models are correct, OK? Which essentially tells you something about what you could learn from the conclusions sometimes drawn. And in fact, since then, there have been other people who have written articles uh, just the opposite of the conclusions that this group of uh, modelers did. So again, uh, what I'm trying to point out is that there is quite a bit of uncertainties. NARCAP was another study done at NCAR where they took a combination of different GCM models with the regional climate models and uh, did scenario analysis for the using the 1970 to 2000 as precursor and comparing it to 2040 to 2070. And then as you see, three of those combinations show that Western United States is gonna get drier and three of the combinations are gonna to point towards getting wetter. So if you are to talk to people in departments of water resources, what do you tell them? Flip a coin essentially because this is what it is or if they pick a certain model then the conclusions could be pretty biased towards what's happening. So drought, drought for our part of the country is a major issue. And uh, not only in the US, but abroad. And a number of years ago with Siegfried Schubert, who used to work for NASA Goddard, we were at the workshop in Barcelona. And uh, the result of that workshop was that where are the skills in terms of models capabilities for predicting the drought? It's usually in the range of short time periods and very large parcels of the globe in the hundreds of thousands of kilometers. That's where the skill is relatively good, but you see in weeks to maybe less than a season. Where people really do need the information, usually it's either low or unpredictable. So I'm not so sure where that field is going in terms of the ability of climate and regional climate models to predict droughts, I think it's, it's still a work in progress and it will take some time for people to start building confidence in these things. So 
to just have my message for this part of the talk, what is the message? Is presently the accuracy of hydroclimate model predictions falls short of meeting the requirements of water resources planning and hardly used for operational purposes and unwise to push their use while highly uncertain. So I don't think there are that many agencies, even in California, that use climate model outputs for decision making. They still prefer to use their statistical approaches. Uh, and then, so my conclusion again is that at the end of the day, it's the resilience in water resources system design and planning is still the safest way to go. And you know, if you look at the developments on the Colorado River Basin, at uh, the time when Hoover Dam was built was not necessarily with any kind of major hydrologic considerations of the climate, et cetera, but it was built and uh, maybe over capacity, but certainly has been very profoundly influential in the water management in the Western United States and with the Glen Canyon Dam, the two of the two reservoirs, when they're filled to the capacity that each one provides two and a half years of sustained water for the Western United States where they're used. So you could say that you have resiliency for, for three or four years combined, uh, but uh, you don't want to draw the reservoirs down to nothing either. So, all right. So resiliency, when I talk about it, and we are in an engineering school, has been really through water resources uh, development, and uh, it's been mostly through engineering approach of controlling, storing, pumping, and transferring water, and a lot more that goes with it. So this is where a lot of the developments have been. In the U.S., more than 70,000 dams were built, but no, not anymore in the past 25 years or so. China is still building quite a huge number of, and then in the Middle Eastern regions and other places, still uh, building infrastructures is important. Sadly, of course, with capabilities of pumping, groundwater depletion has become a, a, a pretty much national emergency for many countries where it's been out of control. And the country of my birth, Iran, is a good example where maybe hundreds of thousands of illegal wells have depleted the aquifers, uh, which will not necessarily recover uh, that easily. And uh, these are the type of problems. So here are some of the infrastructures, the Central Arizona project, which was, by the way, pushed by the agricultural sector, 20 years, billions of dollars of investment. Once the water arrived in the Tucson and Phoenix basins, Agriculture had no interest in using the water because they said it was too salty and it was not going to be helpful to them. They preferred to pump water from the groundwater, so it became a problem for the cities of taking this water, removing the salt, and doing something with it. And Tucson actually uses it, recharges the aquifers. Uh, that's been the case, but at the cost. All right, so how do Hydrologists in the past have dealt with uh, addressing uh, extremes in water resources engineering. It's been through stochastic hydrology. I don't know how many places still teach this stuff, but when I was a student, that was one of the big things, and Harvard water program here was one of the key places where some of these tools and techniques were developed. So essentially, the idea is that we use statistical hydrology, you get the observations from a particular point on a on a watershed, if it's stream flow, then you have a historical sequence of the information, uh, and then you use either partial duration series or you use the annual series of the maximums and fit the probability distribution through that data, and then use that probability distribution as the basis. And the assumption that went into stochastic hydrology or statistical hydrology was that the History repeats itself, and that's the whole notion of stationarity assumption that people have criticized. And then based on that, synthetic hydrology was developed where you generate sequences of information from the distributions that you fit to your watersheds of interest or river basins of interest, and use that as a basis for the type of extreme value analysis you do for design and operational purposes. So, 
This is a semi-log paper. At least when I was a student, we had to use it. No computers to help us with just put the dots and fit the data for a particular hypothetical stream flow. If you're interested in a 100-year flood, and then you had the curve, you would go to the curve, and then you go and see what is the reading of your stream flow. In this case, hypothetically, 400,000 CFS. It's a little too large for a major river, but anyhow, it doesn't matter. But then the, under the climate change scenario, there are two things that are likely to happen. One is, of course, the worries about the stationarity that has come up. And a paper was published in Science by colleagues. So Chris Milley was the lead author on that, say stationarity is dead. Well, actually, stationarity was never there. Stationarity is an assumption, like linearity is we make an assumption for our conveniences. But we know that the system is not stationary. It's stationary for certain parts of the data, but not necessarily everywhere. So it, it, and in fact, Chris Milley admits himself, says, well, you know, it was just amazing how this paper, like it was a major discovery. But anyhow, realities are its system has been like that. So we know that with variability that takes place, the system is not stationary. So the old statistical methods that they have used for design purposes, every highway uh, agency that you go, California Department of Transportation, they got these maps of flood control districts that are statistically based, based on regression where they use those for their design purposes of culverts and so on. But those are kind of obsolete and outdated because of the climate change. So there are two things that could happen. One is that just no necessarily uh, nothing major except that we see a max higher trend in, uh, in flow or lower trend in flow. And if those two things happen uh, with that variability, then the definition of your 100-year flood will change depending upon which scenario you hit. If you hit the higher means of uh, uh, precipitation and runoff, then your definition of 100-year flood changes to much more frequent occurrence. So if you have an infrastructure that was designed based on that data, it's no longer adequate. And the opposite will happen at the other end, which would be probably good news, but then you have less water. The more important scenario is the variability. Maybe the mean stays the same, but we see the extremes. And the case for increase in extremes in precipitation and droughts and others have already been relatively established in the past 30 years or so. And if you look at that case, the same thing happens again. 100-year flood is no longer a 100-year flood. If you have higher variability, maybe it will happen much more frequently. And and the opposite is true if it becomes less variable, okay? So that's the challenges that have been faced by communities and places where a lot of the infrastructure now gets damaged um, because the system is simply not able to handle these kinds of variabilities and changes. And uh, so whether the infrastructure bill will pass and money will be provided, so a lot of these infrastructures probably will benefit from an upgrade. So let me get to the part that is dear to my heart, which is some of the data issues. For users of model information, the key question is which model or group of models should be trusted for their accuracy, okay? And part of that answer is to what degree should we trust the observations used, not only as input, but also as reference to test the models, because you have to validate and verify. And this is always a problem, and in hydrology, from the traditional hydrology point of view, where people are used to model calibration, testing, and validation, uh, it's very hard to accept models that don't go through that kind of test. And that's something that's seldom done in the climate modeling community, okay? And they give you 10 arguments why maybe this is not really something that it should be done. So two main observations, uh, many observations, but two main observations that are relevant to hydrology are precipitation and a stream flow. I'm not gonna be talking about stream flow because I like to focus on precipitation because that's the work that my center does and I think it's really important when it comes to uh, extreme values. Uh, this picture I took from when I was in Tucson from my house 
during the monsoon season, which is usually from July, middle of July to the end of August. We get a rainy period in the every af afternoon, 110 degree temperature. Then you get these convective storms. It's a fascinating thing to see. And this particular storm in the foothills, fancy houses, rich people, uh, quite a bit of damage done in a matter of 45 minute <coughs> precipitation. And uh, what did the gauge information tell you, which is stationed at the airport? Zero rainfall that day, okay? So the key is gonna be really, how do you really deal with issues like this? Having adequate high resolution both in time and space, especially for extreme value events is really crucial and important, okay? So what are the type of things that are used for precipitation estimation? We've got rain gauges, which have been traditionally used and the preferred choice of hydrologists and others because that's water on the ground. It's collected in a bucket and measured. Then we got the radar that shoots beams in the sky, maybe a couple of thousand meters above the, the ground. And so the question is how well they do. And then satellites, which are kind of newer, but maybe the future direction is moving in that direction because even NASA, the last mission, was global precipitation mission that was probably about a billion and a half investment, which is successful, and it's flying, and hopefully providing good information, and it's got an active radar on board. So if, let's say, focus on the Western United States, because much of my work and my group has been on the Western United States. Uh, this figure shows radar coverage. So each one of these circles represents about 200 kilometer coverage of the radars, which is the Doppler radar system deployed around the United States. So you see there are certain mountainous areas where a radar doesn't penetrate, so you cannot really cover those areas. And this is when the angle of the radar is about three kilometers about the surface of the Earth. So please take a look at that figure as I click. I go and drop the angle about one kilometer less, you will see you have less coverage. And if I drop it another 1,000 meters, and only about 1,000 meters above the ground, you see that the radar coverage in the Western United States doesn't really give you much uh, information, okay? And part of the problem is that, as I said, it's still about 1,000 meters above the ground. And the reason the choice of three kilometers was because most communities felt that radars generate radiation and it's gonna have an impact on health and the compromise was that they will hold it a little higher. No, they don't operate it at one kilometer either. Now, if you look at the gauge information, which I've shown here, on the average for Colorado River Basin, these are official gauges of the National Weather Service, it's one gauge per 600 kilometers square. So I'm sure you guys are smart. You can do a little square to see how much 600 kilometers square is. In general, it doesn't add up too much. The storm I showed you around Tucson, my distance to the airport from my, where I took it is only 15 kilometers. And obviously, this is not the kind of coverage. And most gauges happen to be in urban areas, mountainous areas where they get most of the rain, have rarely gauges, okay? Uh, Mr. Miao, Dr. Miao that was working with us, we did some work over China. So just as an example, if you look at the northwestern part of China, there is one gauge per 25,000 kilometers square on the average. And in the more the monsoon region of China, it's about two gauges per 10,000 kilometers square. So it still is quite a few gauges. So when people try to do comparative studies on analysis of uh, extreme events using precipitation information. We use a lot of statistical cleverness of doing these things, but the realities are the base data itself is, is, is not there, and you, you statistically disaggregate in order to get higher resolutions. So only when people talk about super resolution, I only worry about where do they get the data and fundamentally, precip is a crucial one, and how do we get it? Well, let's see where we are going with satellite observations of rainfall estimates. Uh, there are three different types of satellites that are in operation. We have the geostationary satellites up here, 
35,000 kilometers above Earth, geosynchronized with the rotation of the Earth, and they are always looking at the same point uh, constantly, and therefore you have full coverage between the U.S. has two of them, Europeans have theirs, every country, Western country and Eastern countries such as China, India, have it. So they share the data, which is great. Then we have polar orbiting satellites. These are passive radars that go around the pole, but they look at one location and they pass over it. So it's a snapshot. You have to wait another 12 hours before it comes back. So if you're dealing with a convective type storms, it's come and gone. Maybe 10 other came in between and you miss them all. And that's part of the problem. Then we had the TRIM tropical rain measuring mission that NASA launched, and this was one of the, I guess, somewhat successful and unsuccessful, successful in the sense that it lasted for more than, I don't know, what, 14 years or something? And it was to be an experimental satellite to measure tropical ma rainfall for three years, but since it sur survived and it was very useful, NASA had to come up with the money to keep it going for a number of years, and they brought it down maybe four years ago because it was running out of fuel. But that one had an active radar, and it actually slices the atmosphere and looks at all the information. But again, it's a snapshot. Now, the global precipitation mission that was launched a few years ago is a constellation of active, uh, one active and passive radars, and every three hours is supposedly mapping precipitation around the world. Okay. Now, my group, we got into this thing using artificial neural networks back in the 1990s. And at that time, I presented that, and I was sharing that information, Jim, I guess. And uh, at a meeting, I said, hydrologists need high resolution data. At that time, satellite data was used to map precipitation on a monthly aggregate at 250 kilometer by 250 kilometers for climate models. But we said, that's not of use to us. We need to move towards. I said, how do you do it? I said, well, you know, there are these new tools, such as machine learning tools. Well, they thought I was crazy. But anyhow, that's 20 some odd years later. Uh, our system is known as precipitation estimation from remotely sensed information using artificial neural network Persian system. OK. And it uses a, mostly the IR-based information, but uses the passive radar stuff to calibrate the nodes of the artificial neural network. So the papers are there, and I can't really get into much details of those. A follow-on to this was using some cloud classification schemes, because certain types of clouds were based on IR, could be cold, but don't produce precipitation. So can you filter those out? And this resulted in what is known cloud classification scheme that allowed us to go to four kilometer resolution precipitation. And uh, I'll talk about that. Our algorithm is part of a three components of the GPM algorithm that NASA now uses. Uh, ours represents the IR part of it to give the high resolution in time information. Then the NASA is the GFC. Uh, so this is the new algorithm that is now being used by NASA. It's called uh, uh, as an iMERGE algorithm. And again, publications are plenty related to this. And uh, uh, so let me tell you a little bit about what we have done with our data sets. NOAA, about five, six, six years ago, came to us and said, since our algorithm can use geostationary information, and the first set of satellites that started looking at the infrared, which is the temperature top of the clouds, which is an indication of perhaps raining, uh, can we go back and use the data from the early generation of satellites and come up with a climate data record? So that's why it's called CDR. And uh, the work was done and uh, with uh, Hamed Ashuri and uh, Professor Colin Shu, whose algorithm was the original work in his dissertation work with me at the University of uh, California. And the paper was published in BAMS about a, two years plus a few months ago. And the data we delivered to NOAA, it's bias corrected against some information that comes from the Global Precipitation Climatology Center in Germany and uh, US. And then we correct it, we bias correct it, we produce it. 
And the nice thing about it, it's high resolution. It's daily at 25 kilometer by 25 kilometer. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, the, the advantage that this particular data set has, for instance, if I'm interested in looking at the Sierra Nevada data set, I can zoom in, uh, look at the data for 36 years, so 34 years now, and every quarter we are updating it, the information. If I take a particular year, I can see it month by month for 34 years averaged. And if I am interested in a given month, let's say December, I can look at the information on a daily basis. That is crucial for extreme event analysis, okay? So there have been many regional evaluations. It's incredible to see how much if people are interested can do in two and a half years and publish papers, okay? So if you go to the literature, you will see that there have been quite a few evaluations of that in different parts of the world taking place. Unfortunately, a lot of time you see apples and oranges are compared. And this is, by the way, the lowest hanging fruit when it comes to the work in precipitation, satellite precipitation. Everybody loves to compare algorithms and, and write papers, and they're easy to publish if you're interested, by the way. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is the low hanging fruit. The sad part is nobody is really interested in getting to the type of problems we've already identified where the difficulties are, where the challenges are, try to improve the algorithms, nobody does that. We also have formed our own data distribution, and this is called the CHRS, it's our center's name, RainSphere. And RainSphere is an integrated system of global satellite precip data and information. First of all, we have a data portal. If you go to that website, you can get the different products according to the specifications you have, what format you want it, and you can download it and uh, use it. And this become pretty popular website since it was uh, uh, actually released. Well, in terms of the climate data record, again, we have this website, which is called CHRS RainSphere. And if you go, there are different fields by which you can customize the data as you wish, okay? In terms of map layers, types of rain data you want, and uh, comparisons, you can get statistics and trends, and then you can actually, through this drop-down window, say you want it at the national level, you want it at the state level, at the watershed level, and uh, this is all Python code and rather fast and quick. So for instance, if you're interested in a country like China, you go there and just choose China for the number of years you want. This is annual data. For instance, we sl I selected here for this one, and you can get to see the, on the annual basis what kind of trends. And we use just do simple statistics of a candle test. And then you can see it, and then you can get the data for every single year. And if you're interested in a particular province, you can do the same thing. Again, you click on this data. It analyzes the data for that region. You can go to the watersheds and different, different ways by which you want it. Remember at the beginning, I told you that Theoretically speaking, the global warming, you expect to see more evaporation and more water, and it should be an increase in the amount of global precipitation. The satellite data, unfortunately, doesn't show that. If you look at, globally speaking, these figures show the precipitation over the oceans and over the continents, and there is no really detectable increase in the precip. Uh, so therefore, the question is, with all that, you know, increases in temperature, particularly in the past three decades, where is the rain going? I should say that the limitations of these satellite data is 60 degrees north to 60 degree south latitude. So the question is, are they going towards the North Pole or the South Pole? And I've asked colleagues in that field, they cannot really tell. Uh, and by the way, the satellites are the only ones that actually now are able to give you quantitative estimates of precipitation over oceans because we didn't have that information before. Anyhow, these informations are available. The nice thing about this rain sphere thing is under the trends you can go, you can look at the trends by country, even though globally speaking, 
we don't see a detectable change, but we do see detectable changes by countries and by regions. And the hash lines represent that there is a downward or a upward trend, but statistically not significant. When you have solid lines like Saudi Arabia or parts of Africa, et cetera, you will see that, in fact, it shows that there are detectable decreases. And North Africa, interestingly enough, a big part of it shows a detectable increase in the amount of precipitation in the past 30 years. So you can look at it as you wish. You can get a point estimate for a given location. It's a, I was giving a talk at Reno, so I showed that, for instance. You can go to that website, and it will tell you the trends of precipitation for that. And you can go, actually, to more finer res resolutions of the data. You can look at the Colorado River Basin, for instance, and you see, of course, as expected, there has been a decrease in trend and precipitation detectable. And then you can go actually to watershed scale and look at the data. The other part of our data set that has become popular is our real-time resolution, which every 30 minutes gets updated. It's known as iRain, okay? And there is actually app, both Android version and uh, iOS version of it that I encourage you to download and just try to see and give us feedback because it does have a crowdsourcing element that we get feedback that what the hell are you talking about? It's not raining here or it's raining here. How come you don't show any rain? So we collect this information to see how improvements can be made. And this has been really useful, uh, particularly these days, because every 30 minutes it updates uh, information about rainfall globally using all the satellites combined. And I won't get into too much details, but it's the foundation of it is mostly geostationary using other satellites for the calibration purpose. Uh, so this one, for instance, looking at the Harvey uh, tropical storm that happened uh, during the August season and hit um, it, uh, Texas. So as you see, for instance, you can really monitor quite a bit of it you can click on a particular point. For the US, we have both the radar and the gauge information integrated, so you can do the comparison if you wish. And then just pretty much see, so this one is going through the steps of clicking on the points and trying to see. We have tutorials incorporated, where it's four minute tutorials of explaining how to use it. So for instance, here is a comparison, for instance, between what our satellite product did against gauge and radar. As, as you see, there is pretty good, consistent uh, evaluation that takes place. And uh, you can, you know, these are some other examples of what, what is able to do. Uh, our mobile device that was asked by UNESCO for us to do, and in COP23 they uh, released it, uh, allows you to actually use the uh, mobile devices that everybody has in order to look at the data or download it if you want. So the question is, who cares? Who uses these data? Okay, that's at the end of the day, maybe if it's just, oh, you got me another paper and a bunch of nice citations. Uh, but for us, it's a little beyond that point. This is the statistic of users. Uh, as of yesterday, Dr. Fu Wen, uh, who is actually in Vietnam, hopefully they gave him his visa to come back to the US is an adjunct assistant professor in my group. There are about 700,000 users um, since uh, December of 2009. Most of it is increased here. Our download of the data is exponentially increasing. And if you go to our stat page, you will see who are the users, where they come from, and the flashing lights on the people who are logged into our system in the past 24 hours. So it updates it. So there are users, and uh, which makes us good. There are 199 countries that uh, have been using it. And the team that developed much of the software for this was a pretty modest group, not big, big budget. Nobody pays for these things. And it was full win at the middle, and a couple of other dedicated undergraduate students, plus one PhD student that developed all these uh, uh, softwares that I talk about. Let me come to the end of my talk. So how much should we trust remote sensing observations? Okay, after all, this is new information. Like any other information, has its own problems. 
There are tons of satellites producing different types of information. And in fact, SMAP, Professor Entekabi is the PI on it uh, that looks at the soil moisture. And uh, it came after a uh, European satellite, uh, SMOS or SMOS. Uh, but there are different types of things uh, that uh, measure different types of information for us. Uh, so, uh, you know, GRACE has been labeled as one that really can detect groundwater for us. If I look at problems that we have, for instance, in the precipitation, I'll tell you that nothing is perfect. Okay, first, IR-based algorithms are good with convective type storms because it measures the cloud top temperature. So if you have serious clouds, which are cold, it gives you false information that it rains, but you know there is no rain. Warm clouds are not as cold, so maybe producing humongous amount of precipitation, but they're not able to detect that unless you mix it with other things. So machine learning tools and deep machine learning tools have become handy. And then you have convective storms that they do relatively well. So for instance, the two red dots are areas that still need quite a bit of work to get rid of the false alarms and so on. The devils are in details, okay? Much of the global data sets on precipitation that had been generated over the years use this particular grid set data that is processed at NCDC. And I tell you, it's a daunting task and you don't want to do it. But when you're producing rainfall information at a monthly scale, Nobody looks at the details, but since we had to do the information at the daily scale, Dan Braithwaite in my group, poor guy, had to look at every single scene that we had per day, 365 days for 335 years. So you will see a lot of horror kind of stuff like this that were part of the data that GPCP produces, and yet we had to reject these things and go back to them so people who were in charge of this data don't like us at all because we asked, could you improve this? Some they did, some they didn't. Otherwise, we could have gone all the way to 1979 to the present, but we decided to dismiss the first few years and start from 83 because the data had quite a bit of problems. So devils are in details, my friends, all right? Uh, this is another one. Landslide risk maps, you know, NASA has come up with this and other scientists got tons of money to look at maybe satellite information for, for landslide risk assessment globally. So you see the color coding there. Uh, the red is places that are most susceptible to landslide, yellow is the second most, and the green is the third, and so on. When this data was shown in a meeting in Australia was by a distinguished colleague from NASA. Uh, I'm from Iran, so naturally, always everything that is shown, my eyes are attracted toward that part of the world to see what I can see. So I noticed one thing here. This is Iran. I said, how could the central part of Iran, which is pretty much desert, and the highest things you could see are sand dunes, be at the risk of four out of five for landslides, so I raised the question, of course, since then I think they modified this. But my point is that you really do need to look and not to just believe whatever is published and produced here. So I said that will to doubt, always good to question the credibility of the information reported. The other part of it is not only observations, but model generated data is another thing that we should really worry about. These days you tell people to go and get some data say, where did you get it? Well, from a website, you say, what is it? Well, sometimes they're accumulated data, okay? And NAR is, for instance, North American reanalysis data, model generated data. These are over the irrigated lands, uh, regions of California. There are two modest products at the beginning that you see here that show ET estimates, one from University of Montana one from University of Washington, both use the same satellite, but their algorithms are different. So you see there is quite a bit of difference. The, the good news is at least they detect the variability over wetland or, or irrigated area versus non-irrigated, so that's good, it's not uniform. When you come to reanalysis information, both from the 
data simulated system, GLDAS, and North American data analysis, you see they're quite substantially different. So the question is when these kinds of information gets into the analysis and you try to provide it to the farmers and others, what is the actual value of the evapotranspiration? That's really a problem that uh, one has to worry about. So uh, this is a, a work in progress and hopefully will, will improve things. Groundwater, as I mentioned, uh, GRACE has been really showcased quite extensively in the literature as really being able to detect um, variabilities or drop in groundwater aquifer systems. But the, the footprint of the satellite itself is 300 kilometer by 300 kilometer. I put Beijing at the center of this. So when people draw conclusions about the depletion of groundwaters or vice versa of a region using a data that is average over three kilo, 300 by 300 kilometer by using statistical methods to do it is quite far from what actually is happening in the region. And this is something that uh, has been finally, finally spoken about because quite a bit of publicity was given to the application of GRACE in helping groundwater hydrology and so on. And until maybe a couple of years ago, a couple of distinguished colleagues from USGS Bill Ali and Lenny Konikow wrote this article, Bringing Grace Down to Earth, and subsequently there have been quite a few others that have started pointing out that it's not necessarily as good as that it's been made to be. So I think it's really important for particularly younger folks to, to appreciate these things. But the good news is we're getting close to the reception. And this is my last slide. Despite advances to date, I think predicting the future hydroclimate variability will remain a major challenge. Of course, nature is complex, and observing and modeling it is nonlinear behavior is very challenging. And uh, so have a will to doubt the credibility of the information. But no matter what, long-term sustained observations are crucial and not only from space, but ground-based, and unfortunately you see a lot of cuts in the budget of agencies when it comes to ground-based observations. But uh, uh, we hope that uh, things will improve in the future, maybe with better technologies. So again, I come back to my final or earlier conclusion. Resiliency in water resources is still the best solution to deal with these uncertainties. And with that, thank you very much for your patience and listening to me. <laughs>